Hey, Mike from Prep Pros here back with another video. We're gonna run through the calculator section of the March 2023 test, which I ended up getting a perfect 1600 on. So make sure you take notes as you go through. I'm gonna talk about how I look to solve these questions along with some tips and tricks and techniques that can make solving very similar questions easier for you in the future. If this video helps you out, make sure to subscribe and like and share this with some friends. All right, question number one. A touring company purchased a new tour bus for $100,000. The graph models the value of the bus as a function of the time and years since it was purchased. Which of the following is closest to the number of years after the company purchased the bus? The value will be half the purchase price. Well, all we're really looking at here, and I'm gonna zoom in on this so it gets a little bit easier to follow along, is well, half of 100,000 is gonna be 50,000. So we're really seeing right about this point here. So we just have to kind of go up from the x-axis. Now, you always wanna be careful how graphs are scaled. Each of these lines, and now I'm so zoomed in that my stylus is a little fat, but each of those lines is gonna be two, so we can see that it's gonna be three of those twos in, so it's gonna be six years, it's gonna be halved. All right, question number two, pretty simple percentage question. What is 90% of 80? If you're comfortable doing these the shorthand way, you should simply be doing 80 times 0 0.9, and that will give you 72. You could also solve this is x over 80 equals 90 over 100. This is kind of the alternate way that I also teach these in my math book. All right, question number three here. So the scatter plot shows the average price of a ticket to a certain theater for 12 select years from 1959 to 2014. An exponential model for the data is also shown. For which year is the predicted value of the average ticket price closest to 40? Well, the really important thing to know when we're looking at kind of lines of best fit is predicted is the actual line, not the points. So all we're looking at is closest to $40. So we wanna be really careful about which axis we're looking at. So we're gonna go over from 40 and we'll see that we hit right the line at this point. So this is gonna be about 32 or 33 years. And the really important part is it's years after 1959. So we're simply doing 1959 plus, we'll just say 33, and that gives us our correct answer there of 1992. All right, question number four here. The table shows the prices of three items in a certain store on January 15th, 1913. On that date, Ayana purchased eggs and potatoes for a total of 80 cents. She purchased 24 eggs Based on the prices in the table, how many pounds of potatoes did she purchase? Well, few different ways we could do this. Well, one simple way we can think about this is we know that, well, every 12 eggs is gonna be 37 cents and she purchased 24 eggs. So that's gonna already make up 74 cents. So we're saying 74 cents plus, we know each pound of potatoes cost two cents plus 0 0.02p equals 0 0.8. Well, now we just have to solve for P. So we subtract over our 0 0.74, and we get 0 0.02P equals 0 0.06. That's gonna give us that P equals three, and we can find our correct answer. Just always be careful on questions like this, that you're being careful that this is like actually 12 eggs. They're just putting those little kind of wrinkles in there to throw you off. All right, so exact same table again. Um, on January 15th, 1913, Samuel purchased S pounds of sugar and P pounds of potatoes for a total of 16 cents. The total weight of purchase was four pounds. Based on the prices in the table, which system of equations represents this situation? Well, what we know is the total amount of sugar and the total amount of potatoes is gonna have to add up to four pounds in total. And then we know as we're going to the price equation, we know that we're gonna, it's gonna be six cents per pound of sugar plus two cents per pound of potato, and that's gonna have to add up to 16 cents. And that's how we can see that A is our correct answer. Now, you can always just kind of go equation by equation. This is typically the one that's like the easiest for most students, and that would help you get rid of these two. With C, you can see they're kind of flipping around what they should be equal to for the two equations, but you're always just being consistent equation to equation. This is our total pounds equation. This is our price equation. All right, number six here. 
So teeny tiny table, so I'll zoom in for you guys so you can kind of see that as we work through the question. Um, for a polynomial function, the table shows some values of x and their corresponding values of y. Which of the following could be the graph of this polynomial function? Well, the first point here we can see is negative 2 comma negative 2. So I know when I'm at negative 2, I'd have to be at negative 2. Well, a is definitely not at negative 2. B is not at negative 2. C, these are really bad reproductions by College Board. Um, at negative 2, it doesn't really seem like it's quite at negative 2, but we'll check another one for C. D definitely seems like it's, it's there as well. Um, this is when they all, always release the test, they're not in the greatest quality. Then the next point we can check is 1 and negative 2. So if we're over at the point 1, we'd have to be at negative 2. We can see this one is way too negative. That's how we can see that D is our correct answer. At 1, we're at negative 2 for D. Just check the points when you get these table questions. Just be careful with them. In the given scatter plot, a line of best fit for the data is shown. At x equals 2, what is the y value predicted by the line of best fit? Now, really important for these, since it's predicted by the line of best fit, you don't care about the dots. You're just looking for, when we're going from 2, where we hit the line of best fit, and that's going to be at 3. All right. A right circular cylinder has a height of 6 inches. The radius of the base of the cylinder is 5 inches. What is the volume in cubic inches of the cylinder? Well, the um, volume of a right circular cylinder is going to be the same as, and you're given this on the SAT, um, pi r squared times the height. So we have a height of 6 and we have a radius of 5. So this is going to be the same as 5 pi times 5 squared times 6, and this is going to give us 150 pi. All right. The function f is defined by f of x equals m of x plus b, where m and b are constants such that m is greater than 1, so that means we're having a positive slope, and b, our y-intercept, is between negative 7 and 7. Which of the following could be the graph of this function? Easiest thing to always start with on graph questions is the y-intercept. A, the y-intercept, is not between negative 7 and positive 7, so we can get rid of that. B does pass this test, C passes this test, and D also passes this test. Now, let's move to the second part. The slope has to be greater than 1. So all of these slopes are all positive, so we don't get anything really easy to eliminate, but if we're looking at this in terms of rise over run, and if you want to be really careful, you could always select multiple points, but here I can pretty easily see I'm not going up 1 over 1 on B, so that's not going to give me 1. But for C here, I can see I'm going kind of up, over. It's like I'm going up 1.5 over 1, so that would give me a slope greater than 1. Same thing here. From here, I'm not going up 1 over 1, so I can see that D is wrong as well. The really safe way, and if you're not really confident, is I would always just pick points on these, and then you can officially solve for the slope. That's kind of your super safe way of working through the question. Um, question 10, the ratio of a person's weight on Earth to the person's weight on Moon is constant. So an astronaut who weighs 540 Newtons on Earth weighs 90 Newtons on the Moon. So we know we have 540 over 90. Another astronaut um, weighs W Newtons on Earth, so it's going to be equal to W over blank, right? Well, what we can see here is if we simplify this down, 540 over 90 is just going to be 6 over 1. Um, so which of the following expressions represents the astronaut's weight in newtons on the moon? So we now would have to solve for this part down here because this is going to be the astronaut's weight on the moon. That's going to be our variable we're essentially solving for. So we'll rewrite this get rid of some of this stuff to make it a little bit easier. I simplified the 540 over 90 down to 6 over 1. So we'll have 6 over 1 equals w over x. And now we just have to solve for x. So we can just go ahead and cross multiply these. So we're going to get 6x equals w. And now to solve for x, we're simply going to divide out that 6. And that's how we get our correct answer of w over 6 there. All right, question 11 here. Um, 
So a nice table. Okay. As a literature major in college, Sean has read books written by a variety of European authors. The table above shows the number of books written by British, French, and German authors that Sean has read, categorized by the century in which the books were written. If a book referred to by the table was written in the 20th century, so we're just looking at this part of the table, and hopefully this table recreation will still work for us, because sometimes they get messed up when they put these out, um, is to be selected at random, the probability that the book was written by a British author is 15 over n. Okay. So what I'm pretty confident this is supposed to be is this first part is British, this second part is French, and this third part is German. So if we're thinking about this, we're saying the probability of this is going to be 15 over 15 plus 3 plus 10, because probability is just our piece out of our total. And because we said it was written in the 20th century, that means it's going to have to be the number of books referred to by the table that were written in the 20th century. That's going to be all the options that we can pick out of. A would be incorrect because we get this restriction in this probability table for which part we can use. C, the number of books referred to by the table that were written by British authors. If this instead say, if a book was referred to by the table that was written by British authors is selected at random, then that could be the correct answer. In D, the number of books referred to by the table that were written by French authors or German, not correct because we're just focused on the 20th century. All right, same table once again. Um, so Sean also read D books that were written in the 20th century by European authors other than those in the table. I remember the wording on this one was a little confusing. Um, the number of books referred to by the table that were written by British authors in the 20th century is approximately 39% of D. Of the following, which is the closest to the value of D? Okay, so Sean also read D books that were written in the 20th century by European authors other than those in the table. Okay, and now this whole table being confusing once again. So this is British, French, German. Um, so 20th century by those others than those in the table. The number of books referred to by the table that were written by British authors in the 20th century is 39% of D, which is a fine, oh, all right, pretty easy actually. So um, since the number of books referred to by the table that were written by British in the 20th century, so we're just looking at this part of the table, is 39% of D, what we're saying is 15 equals 0.39D. So now we simply have to divide 15 by 0.39. I'm gonna just grab my phone calculator to be safe on this. Um, and that's gonna give us like 38.4, so C would be our correct answer. A little easier on test day when the table was nicely and cleanly put together here. All right, 13 here. The walls of a small apartment were covered using exactly three gallons of paint. The paint was spread uniformly over a total area of 900 square, 960 square feet. What was the rate in gallons per square foot at which the paint was used? Ah, okay. Um, so I'm guessing a lot of students incorrectly picked this here because what we do know is each gallon covers 320 square feet. But since we're saying gallons per square foot, that's gonna give us one over 320. So a little bit of a tricky question here. You just have to be really, really careful with the wording. May always make sure you're answering what the question is actually asking you. Um, because we know one gallon covered 320 square feet. If we're doing gallons per square foot, we're then dividing that. Um, 14 here, the shaded region shown represents the solutions to which inequality. So first thing here is this is being shaded below the line. So this is going to have to be less than or equal to. So I can get rid of A and B. Now I just need to find the correct equation of the line. And here I see two different Y intercepts. So that's going to be the easiest thing for me to pick off of. Well, this is clearly intercepting the Y axis at three, not five. So I can pick D. All right, so more tables. So these will look a little easier to read than the previous ones. Which table could represent the values of x and their corresponding values of f of x for a decreasing exponential function? So exponential is going to be non-constant. So these are our x values and our y values. Well, this would be 
increasing exponential, but we're looking for decreasing. B here, we go one, two, three, four, and we're decreasing exponentially. If we decrease exponentially, we should be getting a smaller and smaller decrease as we go further and further along with our x values, our inputs. So b is correct there. c gives us a linear increase because we're increasing by 8 every single time. And d gives us a linear decrease because we're decreasing by 8 every single time. All right, 16 here. The table shows the yearly snowfall in centimeters in Toronto for nine years. What was the median yearly snowfall? So there's a really helpful trick that I teach in my math book and I teach in my course. Um, so here, if you're ever looking for what the median is of a n numbered list, you're simply gonna do n plus one over two and that's gonna let you know what the median is. So nine plus one over two is gonna give us five. So now when these are ordered from smallest to largest, which on test day, just to be super safe, I ordered them from smallest to largest, I'm looking for where the fifth value falls. So this is our smallest, and this is our next largest. Um, just being super careful here. So next largest, we're three through. Next largest, and that's gonna be our fifth value ordered from smallest to largest. So B is gonna be our correct answer. As I said, on test day, I absolutely ordered these from smallest to largest, just to make sure I wasn't making any mistakes. All right, no solutions. Another thing I predicted we were gonna see on the test. Um, for these, you really simply just have to know what you're looking for. If we are looking for no solutions, we need the x values on both sides of the equation to be the exact same, but we need the numbers to be different. If you think of these graphically, no solutions is telling us we have parallel lines with different intercepts. So if that was our kind of x and y coordinate plane, they're never gonna be able to intersect, so they'll never have solutions. So same x values, different numbers, that's how we can see that A is our correct answer. B would give us one solution, C would give us infinite solutions, and D would also give us infinite solutions because this is just scaled up. Sorry, this would give us one solution as well. All right, um, 18 here. Um, what is the value of x plus 9? So we're just solving for the expression here. Whenever you are asked to solve for expressions, I put a big fat circle on the page. I'm just isolating for x plus 9. So I simply have to add the 5 over 25 plus 5 equals 30. All right, some of the solutions. Back again, we saw this on the no calculator section. Hopefully, if you watched my prediction video or if you've gone through the free trial of my math course, you would have been able to use this formula and get the answer right immediately. We simply have to do negative b over a. Well, our b value is negative one, our a value is positive one. So this is gonna be the same as negative, negative one over one, which just gives us positive one. Learning all these little formulas is really helpful on the SAT. It just starts to give you free points. All right, another thing I predicted once again, the SAT has been loving exponent questions, especially being comfortable with fractional exponents and kind of roots. So if a and b are positive numbers, which of the following is equivalent to the expression above? Now, most of the time, how I teach students to work through this is take the root and express it as a fractional exponent. So this is, no, the square root is the same as the one half power. So this is a squared, b to the sixth, all to the one half. Now, we're using our power rule, so we're multiplying these exponents. Two times one half is just gonna give us one. 6 times 1 half is going to give us 3. That's how we can see that B is our correct answer. All right, well, this is a really long one. Um, the dot plot shows the nine values of a data set with a mean value of A and a median value of B. The value 46 is removed to create a new data set of eight values with a mean value of Y and a median value of Z. Which statement best compares the mean values and the median values of the two data sets? We have been seeing so many of these median questions and whenever you see a median question, use that trick we just went over on a prior question, which I'll go back to again in case you're just jumping to the video at this point, of n plus one over two to find where the median is. So we're gonna solve for our first median and then we're gonna go for the second part here. But the part that I can absolutely tell is the mean value when we remove this biggest value, this essentially outlier is gonna decrease. So. Our new one, what we do know is A does have to be greater than Y. Well, and I guess actually at that point, um, 
we know D is the right answer. But I'm going to solve all the way through um, for those of you who struggled with the median part here. So to start with, we're going to do 9 plus 1 over 2, and that's going to give us the fifth value. So now as we count along here, this is going to give us values 1 and 2, 3, 4, 5. So our fifth value, our current median, is going to be 40. Now if we remove the 46, we're going to have to do the same trick again. We're going to do 8 plus 1 over 2, which is going to give us 9 over 2, which is the same as 4.5. Now if you ever get a 0.5 when you use this median trick, that means you're going to take the average of the fourth and fifth values. So now let's go right back here and we're going to count off. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The median stays the same. That's how we really absolutely know that D is our correct answer. All right. 22. In the linear function g, g of negative 2 equals 3 quarters and g of 3 equals 9 over 2. Which equation defines g? So another thing we absolutely knew we were going to see on the test. This is just a line question. So we have the points negative 2 comma 3 quarters and 3 comma 9 halves. Now usually when you start getting fractions this is where students end up making quite a few mistakes. Um, so you just always want to be really, really careful with these. So we're simply going to start by doing y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 to solve for the slope. And we're definitely going to get one of those two slopes, so we're not going to be able to just jump all the way to our answer here. So 9 halves is the same as 4.5. So I'll just do this a technical fraction way. Um, so this is going to be the same as 18 over 4 minus 3 over 4, and then we're going to get 3 minus negative 2. So this is going to give us 15 over 4 over 5. So let me make sure I didn't make a mistake there. 18 over 4 minus 3 over 4, yep, 15 over 4 divided by, yep, okay, yeah. So this is gonna be the same as, if we're kind of working through this, you can always just take our 15 over four and multiply by the reciprocal, or you can just multiply the denominator by it. So this is gonna be the same as 15 over 20, which is the exact same as three over four. So at this point, we know we're not dealing with C or D. Now from here, the easy trick you can do is we can do y equals 3 quarter x plus b. And now to solve for b, we can simply use either of these two points. So we'll just use the point 3 comma 2. You absolutely could use this point as well. So we're going to plug in 9 halves for y and we're going to plug in 3 for x. So we're going to get 9 halves equals 3 fourths times 3 plus b, because that's what we're solving for. So this is going to give us, I'm using quite a bit of space here, 9 halves equals 9 fourths plus b. Get to do a little bit of fraction work again. So this is going to be the same as 18 over 4 equals 9 over 4 plus b. And then we're going to end up getting that 9 over 4 equals b. Now we get to go back up here, and that's how we can see that a is our correct answer. Now, for those of you where fractions are not super comfortable, absolutely, if this is in the calculator section, just use your calculator. Turn all of these into numbers, use your calculator. There's no reason to make your life harder on the SAT than it already is. All right, so I'll get rid of that stuff there. Um, the function, so that's our f of x, models the length in centimeters of above ground growth known as shoot length of cotton seedlings after emerging from seeds where x represents the seed mass in milligrams and we're saying x is between 68 and 80. That's why the graphs, all of these graphs we can see, they're just between 68 and 80. Now, a few different ways we could do this, but the easiest way that I always like to solve these is just pick a point on the graph. Let's say here, we're just going to pick the point 70 and we're just going to be able to test to see which graph is correct. So we simply are going to do, and I'll write this out kind of the formal way, we'd say, we'd say f of 70 equals 0 0.28 times 70 minus 2.9. And now we just get to solve through. So we're going to do 70 times 0.28 minus 2.9, and that's going to give us 16.7. So what we know is if the graph is correct, 
it's 70, it's gonna have to equal 16.7. And A is gonna have to be our correct answer there. This is far too big, also far too big, and far too small. Most of the time you can simply pick one point and you're gonna be able to find your right answer. All right, 24 here. So the given function f models the length in centimeters of the above ground growth known as shoot length of cotton seedlings after emerging from seeds where x represents the seed mass in milligrams. What is the best interpretation of these 0.28? So this is an interpreting lines question. I have a whole chapter in my book on this because this is such a common concept that students struggle with. The really important thing for a question like this is you always want to think about what is the input of the function and what is the output. Well, what we're thinking about here is x is the input. So we're saying every single time the seed mass increases by one, the corresponding shoot length is gonna increase by 0.28. This has nothing to do with the maximum. For every two seedlings with one centimeter difference in shoot lengths, the estimated difference in the masses of the seeds is 0.28. That's wrong. This is inverse of the situation that the equation is modeling. But D, for every two seeds with one milligram difference in masses, the estimated difference in the shoot length is 0.28. And you can always do these as well by plugging in values. You could plug in one and see what happens to shoot length. Then you can plug in two. When you do that, you're gonna notice that shoot length increases by 0.28. All right, question 25, more median questions. So we see a ton of median questions on this test. Um, which statement best compares the medians of the two data sets? Um, so, okay, this is the frequency. This is a little annoying with the table once again. Uh, so first one, we have one, three, seven, nine. So we have nine things up here. And then we have five, seven, so we have nine again. So once again, we get to use that exact same n plus one over two trick to solve for the median here. Well, that's gonna simply be 10 over two. So that means for both of these, we're looking for the fifth value. So as long as this table is done correctly, these are the values and we wanna count off the frequency part. So this is one, two, three, because there were two of them there, four, and then we're gonna get a fifth as well in here. So the fifth value is gonna be a six. And now here we'll mark off one, two, three, four, five, fifth value is a four. So that means the median in data set one was a six and the median of data set two was a four. So the median of data set one is greater than the median of data set B of two. All right, by examining the pollen in the soil, scientists estimated that the number of Ulmus trees in the ancient population doubled every 664 years. There were N trees in the earliest known sample where N is a constant. Which expression gives the estimated number of Ulmus trees X years after the earliest known sample? Now, I'm gonna kind of pop on the screen the page from my math book teaching the basics of this. Um, but this is a kind of a more advanced variation where when we're looking at this a equals p one plus or minus r to the t, we the most complicated variations, so I have quite a few of these in my book and in my advanced math course, give a lot of students trouble because once you learn the basics, you can see, okay, this is our starting value, so we have to see n. Well, we're doubling, so we're gonna have to see the two here, and then students get stuck because this statement gives them a lot of trouble doubled every 664 years. But there's a little easy trick that you can use to solve these. And once you get some practice with questions like this, it becomes really easy to find the right answer. Now, we always just wanna fact check statements the SAT gives us. It doubles every 664 years. So if I plug 664 in for X, the equation's gonna have to be doubling, which also means it's gonna have to be raised to the first power. This is definitely not gonna be raised to the first power, nor is this. But now this is identical to what we've seen on some of these questions, especially we saw one on March 2020 that was exact same as this. So now if it's doubling, it's going to have to be on the top. And the way that you could look at this as well is if we do 664 times 2, that should give us 1,328. And if we plug, we know after plugging in 664 here and here, they would both double because they'd be raised to the first power. But if we plug in 1,328 to both of these spots, it becomes far easier. And you could always use your calculator to see that B isn't gonna double because that's gonna be two to the one half power. But C is gonna double again because that's gonna be two to the second power. So this lets us see that C is gonna be correct because 
is we crease, keep increasing by 664 years, the value should get bigger and bigger because it could, should be consistently doubling. But B is not gonna be doing that. It's actually gonna get smaller and smaller. That's how you can fact check this statement and see that C is correct. Now, if you struggled with this and you want more practice, for same as questions like 27, I definitely recommend checking out my advanced math course. It's just loaded with tons of questions that are just about these more advanced ones that are really tricky for students. Now, 27 was a repeat from March, 2022. So when I got here, I literally knew D was the right answer without even having to work through the steps because it was absolutely identical. And this is why going through real SATs and working through math questions that are accurate to the test is so important. It gives you an enormous leg up on test day. So here, the technical way we could do this is P percent of X is the same as P over 100 is equal to 13. Well, now if we're solving for X, we simply have to multiply by the inverse because we're dividing out this P over 100. So we'd get that X equals 13 times 100 over P, and that's no different than D. Now, if that feels tricky for you, we can always use a test trick to make our life easier. So we could say 50% of X is 13. Well, that means X equals 26. Now, if I plug in 50 for P, D is gonna give me an answer of 26. You can always plug these values in. That's kind of your cheating way of working through. If you plug in 50 to any of the other answers, they're not gonna equal 26. So um, that's how we can see that this is wrong. All right, 28 straight repeat once again. So teeny tiny twist, but this was the exact same concept from the May 2021 test. Um, the figure represents a rectangular pool with a width of 20 meters and a length of 25 that is surrounded by a concrete border with a uniform width of X meters. If the combined area of the pool and the concrete border is 546 square meters, what is the value of X? So combined area of the pool and the concrete border. So we know the pool is 20 by 25. And we know the combined area is 546. So what I would just start with is we can just check these answers. So let's plug in 0.5 for X. Well, if we're gonna plug in 0.5 for X, this is the part you have to be really careful about. We're adding 0.5 here and we're adding 0.5 here. Same way we're adding 0.5 here and we're adding 0.5 here. So that means the gray part would now be 26 by 21. And so now we just get to check this. 26 by 21 does equal 546. That's how I can tell that A is the correct answer. This is a great example of a question where you want to back solve, you want to use those answer choices. Don't need to make your life any harder than it has to be. All right, 29 here. So this is another thing that I predicted we would see on the test. This is just, we've seen tons of these questions about congruency and similarity of triangles. So it's definitely something you want to pay attention to. Um, in the figure shown, AE and BD intersect at point C which of the following additional pieces of information is not sufficient to prove that triangle ABC is similar to EDC. Well, if we're looking at this, we know that these two angle measures are already gonna be the same. So if we have one other angle measure, which is also the same, that can prove similarity. So AB is parallel to DE. This would prove that they are similar because once they're parallel, going back to our angle rules, we would know that this measure is the same as this measure and this measure is the same as that measure. So that's how we can see that A is not gonna be correct because it would be sufficient. The measure of angle D is equal to B. Well, if we knew what D is and B is, and we know that these two measures are the same, well, therefore we also know that these two measures must also be the same. The length of AB is equal to the length of DE. This is not gonna prove anything. Just because the lengths are the same, right? This figure is not drawn to scale. Unless these are parallel, we're not gonna be able to use any of those angle rules. So the lengths being the same means nothing for them, in fact, actually being similar because they could be at all sorts of different angles. We don't know. So that's why C gives us our correct answer. Now D, the measure of angle A is equal to the measure of angle B and the measure of angle D is equal to the measure of angle E. Now this would be similar, and this is a little bit tricky, because these two angle measures would be the same. Well, let's imagine that these were 30, right? If we did 180 minus 30, 
we would have 150 and the leftovers would be, and I jumped a step there, 150 divided by two because they would each be equivalent. No matter what these, these two angles are here, because we're just gonna have the same amount left over, that's gonna prove similarity because all three angles are gonna be the same. All right, 30. So this was identical to the last question of the October 2022 test in terms of the concept being tested. And you wanna be really careful when you see square units on the SAT. So the area of a rectangular region is increasing at a rate of 20 square feet per hour. Which of the following is closest to this rate in square meter meters per minute? Oh, so must have been a typo with how it's got typed up. So we have our 20 square, and I'll just do 20 feet squared to make it a little bit easier, feet squared per one hour. And now we have to convert this to meters per minute. So first thing we could kind of do here is we could get rid of the hours. So we could multiply by one hour over 60 minutes. And then the next thing we could do here is the easiest way of doing this is this is gonna be the same as, I'll go through both ways. This would be the same as one meter over 3.28 feet. And then you'd have to do that twice and you get one meter over 3.28 feet. Or you can take care of this conversion on your own before and simply do 3.28 times 3.28. And that's what I did on test day, um, just to make my life a little bit easier, because that would give us our kind of way that we could convert from one meter squared is the same as 10.7584 feet squared. And we could use that. So we'll just go through and we'll punch this in. So 20 divided by 60. That gives us 0 0.03. That's why A is our correct answer there. Just be really careful if you see this again on the test. It's shown up relatively consistently. It's starting to show up on the digital SAT as well. It's an easy question as long as you catch the little trick. All right, so now the questions are gonna reset in difficulty. So the line graph shows the number of cars a salesperson sold for each of the first six months of the year. For how many of the months did the salesperson sell 10 or more cars? Well, here's the line for 10. We can pretty simply see one, two, three are above it. All right. The dot plot shows the estimated market value for 15 houses in a neighborhood. What is the mass estimate? maximum estimated market value in thousands of dollars for the data set. Well, the biggest value we see is just 178. And right, since it's in thousands of dollars, that's just our answer. Uh, 33, so another lines question here. Line K passes through the points one comma one and two comma six in the X, Y plane. Uh, the equation line for line K is written in our Y equals MX plus B form. What is the value of M? We just need to solve for the slope. So we can simply do six minus one over two minus one, and this gives us five over one. That just gives us our correct answer of five. Oh, another one of these fun tables. Um, the table shows the distribution of two types of trees at two different sites. If a red maple represented in, in the table is selected at random, so that means we're just gonna be dealing with this part of the table here. What is the probability of selecting a tree from site A? So Site A is gonna be this 63. So it's simply gonna be 63 over 90, which I believe should give us 0 0.7. I'm gonna double check on my calculator so I don't get blown up in the comments for making a silly mistake here. Uh, yep, 0 0.7, that's gonna give us our correct answer there. All right, classic system of equations question. I remember this one from the test. This is something I kind of teach in my system of equations chapter of my book because it's so common in the SAT and it gives you a great shortcut. Anytime you're solving for expressions that are not just X or Y, where it's like eight X plus three Y, five X plus five Y, we've seen this so many times on the SAT, always look to see if you can add or subtract your equations to get straight to the answer. It saves you a ton of time and a ton of mistakes you can make. Well, five X plus three X equals eight X. Four Y minus seven Y equals negative three Y. 44 plus 17 
equals 61. That gives us our correct answer there. All right, the scientist takes two samples of Earth's crust, each with a mass of 3,240 grams. Sample A has a density of three grams per cubic centimeter and sample B has a density of 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. How much greater is the volume in cubic centimeters of sample B than sample A? So density equals mass over volume. So we just need to plug in for this. Um, so each of them has 3,240. So we know we're gonna plug that in. Okay, so we'll start with A over here. So for A, what we're gonna get is 3.0 equals 3,240 over V. And for B, we're gonna get 2.7 equals 3,000, oh, well, that equal sign was throwing my brain out there, 3,240 over V. And now we're just gonna solve for these. So we're just gonna have to cross multiply by V, then we're gonna divide by that value. So for A, we're gonna get 1080, and for B, we're gonna get 1200. So how much greater is the volume of B than A? Well, 1200 minus 1080 is gonna give us our correct answer of 120. All right, pretty easy question for being 37. Another circle thing, this was something we knew we were gonna see on the test. It shows up on almost every single SAT. Well, this is equal to R squared. So your radius equals eight. That means your diameter equals 16. All right, this was another one that I absolutely predicted. And if you're struggling with a lot of this quadratic stuff, definitely check out the free trial of my math course teach a lot of these important rules. This is just testing you on discriminant rules. So for discriminants, b squared minus 4ac has to equal zero. So our b value is k, so k squared minus four times four times nine equals zero. So that's gonna be 16 times nine. Um, so I think that should be 144, but I'm just gonna be careful here, yep. So that gives us k squared minus 144 equals zero. And so now we're gonna get that k squared equals 144. And that's gonna give us that k equals 12 because it says k is a positive constant. And that's gonna wrap up the math section here. So I hope this video really helped you out for those of you who watched all the way through. If you are struggling on SAT math, I strongly recommend picking up a copy of my SAT math book signing up for my SAT math course. And if you're do, already scoring in the high 600s to low 700s, you're really just looking to be able to push your score up to get a perfect or near perfect SAT math score, definitely check out my advanced math course. We really focus on all of these difficult question types and getting used to all of the tips and tricks in easier ways that I look at solving these questions.